Okay, so today we're going to review vector calculus. Now, I emphasize this is a review, so if you haven't seen some of these concepts before, this isn't going to be a great place to start. If you have studied vector calculus before, hopefully this will be a review and remind you of some of the notation. So let's start out with a few concepts. So first of all, let's talk about scalar functions. Usually we'll be discussing some region of space. Uh, I'll usually draw it as an arbitrary potato. Usually this will be a volume V, so I'll use capital V to denote volume. I like to put a line through it just to denote that it's a V. I don't know why, it's something I picked up a long time ago. And capital S to denote the surface of that region. And inside the region we might have something, in this case I'll say temperature, which we're going to define as a function of x, y, z, and time. So we'll talk about this three-dimensional volume and the temperature at every point. And so at every point in space and at every instant in time, the temperature has a single value. So some of the scalar functions that we look at in this course. And we'll distinguish these scalar functions from vector functions. So example of a vector function might be the fluid velocity, which we'll define as a function of x, y, z in time. But now we're going to define it at every point as an arrow. So at every point, the velocity has a magnitude and a direction, which is why I wrote v with a little arrow over it. Um, Usually we'll, for something like velocity, we'll have components. So with velocity, we'll usually la label the x, y, and z components, u, v, and w. Um, some of the fu functions that we'll look at. And depending on our convention for velocity, we'll often use this convention u, v, w to denote the x, y, z, and velocity. Another vector function we'll talk a lot about is heat flux, which we'll, we'll label as q. Here we might do, we might use a subscript to denote the x, y, and z component. Now, we've talked a lot about functions and I've drawn this sort of potato vol volume. Uh, another concept that's important to remember is that of the normal vector. So the normal vector points outward from our surface. Its magnitude is one. And everywhere it makes it perpendicular with the surface. So I'm sort of drawing it two dimensions, but it extends to three dimensions as well. So if this were a three dimensional surface, we'd have a normal vector all around the surface. So imagine taking a potato and sticking a bunch of toothpicks in it. So they're always perpendicular to the surface those would be your normal vectors pointing outward. It's important to also remember the dot product. So let's take a surface here, our normal vector pointing outwards. Now let's say we had some vector field. In this case, we'll say it's mass flux, which I'll denote as the density of the fluid times its velocity. Density has units of kilograms per meter cubed. Velocity has units of meters per second, so mass flux would be kilograms per meter squared per second, mass per unit time per unit area. So it tells us how much matter or fluid matter is uh, crossing sort of an imaginary surface. So if I have a surface like this, I have my normal vector pointing outwards, and say right here at this surface, I had my mass flux vector like that. Uh, we need to remember the dot product would be the mass flux dotted with the normal vector, which would be this component here. And we'll interpret when we have a surface and we talk about a quantity dotted with the normal vector as being uh, the amount crossing the surface, right? Because any component of the vector here is tangent to the surface, so it's flow kind of flowing around maybe the wall of our surface. So it's only the component in the direction of the normal vector, rho v dot n, which is flowing out. Okay, let's talk about some uh, integral quantities. So here's my arbitrary potato, my volume V bounded by my surface S. Now let's imagine that we had something like the density, which is a function of x, y, z in time. And we imagine we go to every little sort of cube that this volume is made up of. So we'll break it into a bunch of little infinitesimal cubes. And if I took the density of that cube and I multiplied it by delta x, delta y, delta z, So that would be the volume of that little infinitesimal cube. And then I sum that up for every little cube that made up this volume. That would equal the total mass, right? Because I'm taking the mass of each little element, right? That's what the density times that volume gives me the mass. And if I then sum those up, I get the total mass. So it's not surprising then. If we wanted to express this in an integral form, we would write the integral of rho, which is a function of x, y, z, and time, dv. And that would equal the total mass. Sometimes you'll see this written as the integral of rho over x, integral 
over y integral over z. That's equal to the same, that would be interpreted as the same thing. So I'm gonna integrate the density dx dy dz over my volume v. But we'll use this sort of more compact notion and usually except for when we need to, we won't always write out that rho is a function of everything. And we'll just write the integral of rho dv as being the total mass. Uh, but it's just important to remember that what we really mean is we're summing up the sort of the mass of every little differential element of our volume. Um, some other places that we'll see this is sometimes we'll, we'll end up doing something like this. Maybe I'll take something that's like temperature dv. And here, temperature times volume, it's not very, uh, very intuitive what that means, but sometimes we'll do something like this and I'll divide by the total volume and we'll interpret this as an average temperature. Because now in this case, I'd be taking the temperature of each little element and summing it up, dividing it by the total number of elements to get an average temperature. Don't forget, integrals have units too. So that when we integrate over the volume, uh, the integral is dv. So here I gave examples of integrating scalar functions. We can also integrate vector functions. So if we go back to the example where I also had a velocity vector in here, I could integrate, for example, rho times v over the entire volume. Now you see why I put the line through it because I have volume and velocity, so it helps me distinguish between the two because my handwriting is always uh, less than perfect. And so now if we think about what this means, so now I've got rho times v, and I'm integrating over the volume, so it's gonna have units of mass times velocity. This is the total momentum. The total mo momentum is a vector quantity. And if we go back to our example of thinking about all the little elements, right? If I had a bunch of little elements and I took their lo local velocity and I took the mv, the mass times the velocity of each little differential element, and I sum those up, right? So now if we think about sort of our particle mechanics, a bunch of little particles all with mv, I sum them all up, that gives me the total momentum of all the, all the particles in that region. That's what we're doing by this integral. So we're taking the, the momentum at each point and we're integrating it over the volume. So in addition to volume integrals, we'll also want to do surface integrals. So here my surface is gonna be bounded by little patches. So here my surface S is gonna be bounded by a bunch of little sort of differential elements or little patches of the surface. And so I can take any quantity I want, I can evaluate it on the surface and I can sort of sum up all those little patches. So um, one that we'll use a lot is imagine, remember this surface has normal vectors everywhere pointing outwards. The fact that we say they point outwards is just sort of a convention. We could also make them point inwards if we wanted, but that would be silly because everybody else in the world points them outwards. And we could talk about integrating a quantity. Say I took the pressure times the normal vector, ds, put a minus sign because pressure always points inwards. So if I evaluated an integral like this, if you remember the pressure is a force per unit area and it always acts normal to the surface. So by multiplying it by the normal vector, I've created a a vector quantity, which is sort of the local force per unit area pushing on little, every little element, ds, pushing inwards. So if I sum those up or integrate around the surface, I would interpret this as the total force due to pressure. So that's just one example of a surface integral. Uh, another quantity like we alluded to before, we talked about the dot product, we talked about density times velocity being kind of like a mass flow. And if we dotted that with the normal vector, that would be the amount it's leaving the surface. So remember, if rho v were pointed in that direction, rho v dot n is the amount leaving the surface. So if I take rho v dot n and I sum that up for every little element, remember this had units, right? Mass flux had units of mass per unit time per unit area. So now I'm gonna integrate over all the areas or sum up the, all the little areas and I'm left with something with units of kilograms per second or mass per unit time. So that would be the total rate that mass is leaving the volume. So if we integrate it around the entire surface, which is bounding the volume, that would give us something in units of kilograms per second. Now, we'll, I'll usually write my integrals in this form. You might also see some people write something like this. Maybe they would write some value F, and then they would write ds, and they might do something like this to denote that it's a closed region, or they might leave it open if it was just an open region. So an open region would be integrating over a surface like that. 
whereas a closed one would be integrating over a surface which bounds a volume. Usually sort of by context we'll sort of explicitly state that. So usually I won't bother writing the whole thing out. We'll write all our surface integrals just with a single integral uh, ds. Okay, so we covered integrals. Now let's do some derivatives. And when we're working with vectors, we have to be very specific about what we mean. So let's start with the gradient that we'll write with an upside down triangle. So just by definition, we have to take the gradient of something. So let's take, start by taking the gradient of a scalar field, so something like temperature, which is a function of x, y, z in time. The gradient is simply the derivative in space in each direction. And we return the argument as a vector. So here i hat, j hat, and k hat would be our unit vectors in the x, y, and z direction. So I take the derivative respect to x, y, and z, and then I multiply it by the vector quantities. So the gradient, so the gradient of a scalar becomes a vector. Now we, we could take make an analogy here. So imagine we have a hill. Here's a contour map of the hill. And here we are, located right here. Here's our coordinate system, x, y. So if you want to know what the, sort of the topology is, and say you have your eyes closed, you're not looking, so you can't see what you do, well, one way you could do it is you could take a step in the x direction and feel how much elevation change you have. You could take a step in the y direction and feel how much elevation change you have. And what you're doing is basically sensing the gradient. Now in this uh, sort of two-dimensional example, the gradient will always point uphill. Here our field was h being the height gradient h always points uphill and it always points uh, perpendicular to contours. So these are lines of constant h and so the gradient is pointing uphill and it's always normal. So the same thing applies to temperature. If these were lines of constant temperature, so here we had a hot spot and here it was cooler, the gradient of the temperature would point uphill pointing to the hot direction. We could prove that uh, lines are always uh, normal, but let me just show you maybe a simple example uh, rather than sort of a formal proof. So we'll have our coordinate system x, y. So let's take two contours of height, h equals 1 and h equals to 2. Uh, this one will pass through the origin even though I didn't quite draw it as much. We'll take our uh, intercept here for the h equals 2 contour to pass through x equals 1 and y is equal to 3. And we said the gradient uh, should point perpendicular. So it should be perpendicular to these lines. And we can kind of see that because, right, the gradient would be the derivative of h with respect to x in the i hat direction plus the derivative of h with respect to y in the j hat direction. And here, if we assume that these are sort of infinitesimally close together, I go from h equals 1 to 2 by taking a step uh, one step in the x direction, so delta h over delta x is approximately 1 over 1, so it's my component in the x direction is 1. Here we have delta h over delta y is I have to take three steps, so to move 1 delta h over delta y, so to move one uh, unit of delta h from 1 to 2, I have to move three in delta y. So here my, my approximate uh, estimate of the vector would be one-third in the j-hat direction. So if I draw a vector now that is one or three one, right, because it's three to one ratio of x to y, then I have something that's perpendicular. So the gradient is always perpendicular to lines, contour lines. The other type of derivative that we'll talk about a lot is the divergence. And here so let's define the velocity vector to be u, v, w for the x, y, and z components. Here I'll take the divergence, I'll write it out as the gradient dot with that. Now I'll take the x component of the velocity derivative with respect to x, add it to the v component of the velocity's derivative with respect to y, add it to the w or the z component of velocity with respect to z. So I can only take the divergence of a vector quantity and that gives, it gives me back uh, a scalar. And it's easy to remember uh, how these work because it's just like sort of normal vectors. So if we imagine the gradient is a vector with x, y, and z components, and I take its dot product with a vector u, 
V and W, the definition of the dot product is I multiply those two things together, those two things together, those two things together, and then sum them all up, which is exactly the result we have there. And so uh, what the divergence is a measure of is whether a vector field, how it's pointing. So imagine we have a point that looks like this. If all my field lines are kind of flowing out of a point, the divergence is a positive number. If all the field lines are pointing in somewhere, so if my velocity vectors are sort of converging on this point, the divergence is a negative number. And it's also possible to have a situation like this where some are coming in, some vectors are coming out, and the divergence is zero. So the divergence is a measure of a vector field of how much the, the uh, vectors at a point are either flowing outwards, inward, or sort of being conserved at that point. And so it's important to remember that divergence converts a vector quantity to a scalar, whereas the gradient converts a scalar quantity to a vector.